right, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody still alive and awake after a great lunch like that, I hope. Well, what an honor it is to have a chance to spend some time together and talk about leadership. It's, uh, it's an important subject. That's why we're here. That's why we're spending this time together. And, and I was able to join uh, after the last break, so I heard from Sarah and Jeremy, and just uh, uh, I missed the earlier speakers, unfortunately. I'm sure they were fantastic, too. But you're the real leaders, and the rest of you are the real leaders who are in the middle of things, uh, working hard and making things happen on a regular basis. And the reason this topic is so important is because leadership is the difference between winning and losing. And I want to just try to spend a little time talking about just a few characteristics maybe for us to, to think about, because for your organization, for your life, the decisions you make and the approach that you take is going to be critical for whether you are on a path that's more successful or on a path that's maybe a little more challenging. And then you just got to find your way back on the road that's more successful, right? That's what we heard earlier. You have to overcome that adversity. So let me just take a little time to un unpack a few things and, and, and try to encourage you as leaders to continue to step up and, and to go where you have to go. So if this is you know, playoff time in the NBA and the NHL, and they always talk about leaders on the, on the court, on the ice, or in any of the other sporting event, you know, boy, those leaders have to show up. The stars have to show up. If someone's going to win, the star's going to have to show up. But in your organization, you're the star. You're the one that people are counting on to show up and to make good things happen. So let me just try to start, if I can, uh, with, a, uh, with one topic to maybe think about as you conduct your work and you conduct your life. And the first thing that I found most important is to make sure you always take stock of who you are as an organization, and as a person, as a leader. Because it's really easy as things come at us, and we're talking about this, this subject because things are coming at us all the time. The, the world of change is never slowing down. It's getting faster. We all know that. And in fact, in the last couple of years, it's gotten, I don't know if I can say more weird. You know, COVID was just one of those things that in my lifetime, you kind of look at it and go, well, where'd that come from? And we did a lot of funny things as a, as a community, as a state, as a world. So how do we deal with that? The first thing is knowing who you are. And going back to some of those founding documents, some of the things you wrote about, some of the things you dreamed about at the beginning when you started your business or you started your career or you started working in a new division, whatever the case may be, in your specific situation. What are those things? Who are you? As a business, if you own a business, if you're the leader of a business, it's important to go back and understand that. At Amway, I would spend my whole life saying, you know, we know who we are and we know why we do what we do. I grew up in the business. It was a pretty easy thing to do. I knew it. I lived it my whole life. And we could always go back. And I, I heard those founding, the founders talk about the business. I saw them live it. I saw things happen. So I was able to go back easily in my whole career and be able to and still know who we are and why we do what we do. But it's easy in a competitive environment to get knocked off course from time to time. And all of a sudden, different influences kind of find their way to knock you off track. In our industry, in the direct selling industry, we had a lot of uh, competitors who we worked with very well, very collaboratively. It was a very collegial industry. Uh, we're all salespeople, right? We all liked each other. We all trying to talk to each other, all selling each other on our own businesses. You know, it's kind of a fun, weird, codependent sort of thing. Um, but uh, there's a couple businesses over the years that, uh, that went public for a lot of good reasons, good businesses. But the public market wasn't kind to our industry. The public market didn't like direct selling. It, it just didn't give it the same valuations. And a lot of the times, the leaders from these organizations would talk about that. They'd say, boy, you know, you know we're not kind of getting the right financial support or, or perspectives that, that should be viewing this business with. And, and you could see them start to drift. They'd say, well, maybe we don't want to be direct selling anymore. 
Maybe we want to be something else. And, and you can see them kind of start to distance themselves from the industry. Some of them would leave our association, our trade association, and, and they would kind of find a different way. They would find ways, and you would watch them find ways to try to describe themselves in a new way that was focused on the public markets, but not focused on their customers, their sales force, or their employees. And it hurt them. So who you are as a company, what role you play is vital. Make sure you go back and validate that on a regular basis so you can approach these changes from a foundation of strength, from a foundation of knowledge of who you are as a business and what you're trying to accomplish for your customers, for your employees, for your community. I think that's really important. And the second one is really close to it. Who are you as a person? You heard from Sarah and, and Jeremy earlier about their, they talk about their faith. What's the moral compass that you have to make decisions? And I think as a leader, we need to continually ask ourselves these questions. And you heard it reflected in their presentations as they talked about, what am I supposed to do? Where, where, what's the difference between right and wrong here in this given situation? And it's hard. It's hard to make those calls because there's a lot of things coming at you. And it's tempting to shave a few things off here and there and kind of cut a few corners or find a, a shortcut if you can. And I just want to encourage you, like the stories that they shared, to have your moral compass set and know where true north is for you. You know, we watched the uh, celebration of D-Day, uh, 80th anniversary. And of course, everybody spoke with very great moral clarity as they look back and about what happened at that day and the good versus bad and the right versus wrong and all these sorts of things that we talked about and celebrated. And it's very clear. Sometimes in life it's not as clear, especially if you don't look back 80 years. So you need to know who you are. We had a lot of experiences uh, at Amway, one of the things that I hated the most was, was a small new competitor kicking your butt. I mean, isn't that the worst, right? You've you're, 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 you're got this thing, you're going in the right direction, you're doing everything you can, and you're kind of plodding along, you're growing a little bit maybe, maybe you're stuck, maybe you're declining, and then some stupid little company just takes off, <laughs> right? And you start looking and go, well, what are they doing? We should copy them. We should do what they're doing. And then you kind of look and you go, ah, woo. I don't think what they're doing is going to work in the long term. But you have to have that thought process to go, what they're doing isn't right. It may work in the short term, but it's not right. And it was easy for Steve and me a lot of times to push back the anxiety, you know, push back the concern. And go, you know, team, let's just let this one play out a little bit. In fact, early in my career, I, I worked in uh, market research, and I looked at a lot of companies like that, and they would have this great literature, and they'd say, you know, we're just like Amway. And they would be, show all their growth that they've done. We're just like Amway. We did this and this. And, and then I would talk to somebody. I'd say, well, it says this company looks really good. Where are they now? And they, oh, they, they went out of business. So I'd say, well, they're just like Amway, except they're broke. <laughs> right? It's easy to try to pretend, but who are you? It doesn't mean that if you have a good North Star and a clear compass that you're not going to make a mistake. We all make mistakes. But you're going to know how to get back on track. My belief that organizations are looking for leaders that have clarity of where the business is, who the business is, and who they are. And you can be, give for, be forgiven a lot of mistakes along the way. Goodness knows I made a ton. And I keep making them, by the way. It's really fun. <laughs> You'd think, gosh, I'm old enough. I shouldn't do this anymore, right? But it keeps happening. But when it does, hopefully you can always keep finding your way to get back on track. 
I think that's an important thing for us to, to think about. I've spent a lot of time uh, you know, over the years recently with a, an organization in Philadelphia, the National Constitution Center, and uh, the CEO there just wrote a book. In fact, Jeff was here for an event we had about a month or so ago, and uh, he wrote a book called The Pursuit of Happiness. And, and it really went to look at that phrase in the Declaration of Independence. And what does that mean? Where does that come from? And how do we talk or think about happiness? And he, he found out that really it came from not just the founding fathers, but well before that, the, the ancients, the, the, the philosophers from Plato and Cicero and, and, and folks you know, 2,000 years ago or more that were thinking about this idea of virtue. And that what we wanted to do as people, if you were going to strive to achieve something, you want to achieve something good. And so this idea of happiness was not to feel good, but to be good. And I think as a leader, we should be pursuing that as well. And it was interesting, he actually had gone through and told the story of how Benjamin Franklin, I'll, I'll, I'll find some of the pieces here, Benjamin Franklin made a list of virtues that he was going to follow. And, and, and these are the things that he put down. He made a list, and every week he was going to go through and see how he did and, and go through. And so here's the, some of the things he had. He had temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity. I don't think Franklin was great at that. And the last one was humility. He wasn't great at that either. It's a tough list. We're not going to be perfect. But as a leader, these are the things we should be striving to achieve, to be good. In fact, to kind of end the story, that was uh, as it went, Franklin had his list, and every week he checked off the list of how he had done, and he got so discouraged by his poor performance that he stopped keeping the list. But he reflected and said, even though I know I didn't live up to the virtues that maybe I had tried to achieve, I was better for having tried. I was better for having set that goal out there and worked towards it, even if I failed, even if I had failings in my life. I was better for trying. We're all going to have our struggles. But who we are as people will help define our leadership in a way that's critical for your organization and to win. The next thing I'd love to, to share and, and challenge us all as leaders is, is to really challenge ourselves to think better. How do we keep looking around and conferences like this are the right way? How do we keep getting outside of ourselves, outside of my businesses to, to see the things that are happening so we can get better? So I'll just share you kind of a personal story. So a number of years ago, I had an opportunity to get to know Charles Koch from Koch Industries. And, and Charles has a, a, a very elaborate uh, management philosophy calls a principle-based management that he's been working on in his life for 60 years about how he began to think about things and this framework that guided the management for him and for his business so they can make better decisions. And it's really elaborate. I, I, just to try to understand it is really hard, but it's fascinating. And you can't argue with his success what they've been able to achieve as an organization over the test of time. So as I began to try to think a little bit differently myself in recent years, I said, I need a coach. I got one. Somebody to help me understand how can I apply those principles. Somebody who will look at me and evaluate me and help me go through, okay, in this situation, how did you handle that? What's going on here? What did you think about? What was your approach to thinking so that you could make better decisions or that you could create an environment for somebody else to make better decisions in the organization. We're not working in a vacuum. We're working with other people on a regular basis. How do we think better? Who in our life is going to help us? Who's our partner? Who's our friend? Who's our colleague? 
who can help us think better, who can challenge us and hold us accountable along the way. Because at the end of the day, you got to make decisions if you're a leader. Early in my career, I had, a, uh, I had an example. I, I was very young. I was the general manager of Amway United Kingdom. And uh, I, I was, you know, first kind of job that I had at that point when we lived in England. And, and I didn't want to make a mistake. And I figured the best way to not make a mistake was to not do anything. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's what I did. But that got me my boss to come big says, look, look, you got to do something. I don't care if you close the door of your office and flip a coin. You'll probably be right as much doing that as thinking about it, but do something. How do we think about things? How do we challenge ourselves? Again, through the National Constitution Center, we had a chance to, to spend some time at an event with a couple of Supreme Court justices, which puts you in your place pretty quick when you think you might be smart or something, and you sit with those folks, you go, oh my gosh. But it was really interesting. Well, you can be a textualist, right? You can be an originalist. You can have all these different ways of thinking about things. And they, these two talked about that sort of thing. But in the end, we got to decide. Nobody else in our country is going to be able to decide. We're going to have to decide these issues. So I got to have all the tools at my disposal. I have to have the, all the understanding and knowledge that I can so I can figure out how to think about this so I can make a decision. And it was fascinating. I thought that, that lesson for leadership, how we can think about things so that we can find a better way forward, that we can find and make that decision because we can put things in the proper context. Well, in this one, I also have to give a plug in to just to say on the inside out, just be curious. Keep asking people. If we can find out as leaders how we can ask better questions, with our teams around us, with the people in our lives, with the customers that we serve, how do we stay curious? Now, I, I want you all go, because when I think about big things like this, there's really two main sources I go to. One is Monty Python, usually fabulous source of uh, insights and information on human behavior. But the second one most recently, or most recently was Ted Lasso. And, and so if you want to go on YouTube and find this segment, and I'm sure as many of you have seen it, where he's doing the dart game, uh, go on darts, Ted Lasso, curious, you know, check it out. Sometimes we lose our curiosity. Sometimes we stop asking questions or we don't ask the right questions or we don't ask the next question. I'd love us to keep thinking about how we can stay curious and keep asking questions. Well, the next point to kind of raise would be, uh, and I kind of touched on it a little bit with my UK experience, right? Act. Do something. Like my boss told me, just do something. Flip a coin. You got to do something. And we've heard, like, the, uh, I think, Sarah, you were saying, when you make a mistake, you overcome it, right? It's, you overcome it. You make the next right decision. You learn. I think that Jeremy was talking about it. You learn, right? We make mistakes. We learn. We get better. We develop. Then we can find a way to success. Take action. But you got to position yourselves to take that action. But you got to take it. You got to make decisions. And you got to recognize that sometimes inaction is, in effect, a decision. So I, I, I like to sail a lot. I race sailboats, and, and I'm just dumb enough to keep doing it my whole life. Uh, so this, in about a month, I'm going to be in the middle of Lake Michigan uh, trying to get from Chicago to Mackinac Island again. And I've done it a lot in the past. And sailing at the end of the day is a pretty simple sport because the only way you go anywhere is when there's wind. So you got to look for wind. And you got to make sure you're in the windy part of the lake because otherwise you're not going to go anywhere. So we were sailing along. And we were doing very well. We had our competition behind us. And we had one of the guys who was sailing with us, an excellent sailor, was helping us, got us out in front. We're doing great. He's like, guys, I got to take a break for a while. Just keep them behind us, us in front, and we'll be fine. Well, the wind was kind of getting lighter and lighter, and we didn't know exactly where to go, and we kept sailing along, and we said, well, the competition's still behind us. I, I guess we'll keep going. Okay, well, I guess we'll keep going. And Well, maybe we should turn. Yeah, but if we do that, it'll slow us down, and it'll have these other sort of things. I think we're okay, and yeah, they're still following us. I guess we're okay, and then they turned. And about the time they turned, we didn't have any wind to do anything. And, and our friend comes up. He looks around. He goes, what happened? 
and we could honestly say, well, we didn't do anything. <laughs> we did nothing. We just drifted along. And we drifted along, right, until we just sat on the lake and we got to look at the scenery for a long period of time while they sailed right by us. <laughs> Prepare yourselves to act. Our whole business, the whole Amway business, was built because we believed that if people were given a business opportunity, if they were given an opportunity, they would do something with it. You, as a leader, are given an opportunity. And I want to encourage you to do something with it. Well, the last thing I want to go through here, just to, as we kind of wrap it up here, is things I say a lot. Make it personal. Make it personal. Leadership isn't just something in theory. Leadership is something that impacts people's lives. It's personal. It's real. The Learning Center at Steelcase years ago, I saw the quote on the wall, right? Now, nothing changes until the leader changes. If your organization's not going in the right way, if your division's not going in the right way, it's not going to change by itself. It's going to change because a leader decided to make a decision to do something different and go in a different direction. Because it's personal. What are your goals? What are your aspirations? What do you want to achieve? Until you can answer those sorts of things really clearly, it's going to be hard to be a leader. And there's some things that only you can answer. A number of years ago, I was in uh, telephone ordering. This was a number of years ago, telephone ordering at Amway. And, and uh, uh, I was uh, doing something with a the team there. And somebody was on a, a called in and heard the commotion in the background. And, and they said, yeah, Doug's here screwing everything up again. So uh, she said, well, can I talk to him? And, and so I got on the phone and was talking to her. And she goes, Doug, I just wanted you to know I moved into my dream house today. And I said, that's great. And I was going to end the call, and she goes, well, I'm not done with my story. And she went on, and she talked a little bit about how she got involved in Amway in the first place. It was really just for a product reason. And then she went and talked about how they just had a product, they were a good customer, but then they had an income issue, and so she became an Amway distributor somewhere in the 1970s. And they built their own business, they built another income, and then she didn't realize how important that would be until her husband passed away. And she still had an income and a business of her own. And she went through this. And every time I would say, well, thanks. She goes, no, I'm not done with my story yet. And she would go on. And she ended and said, I just want you to know. I'm just moving into my dream house. And we ended the conversation. It was wonderful. But I never asked her about her dream house. I realized that recently. I didn't, I didn't say. I said, it was a big, small city, country, mountains, lake. You know, where is it? What's it look like? I realized it didn't matter. It didn't matter what I thought or how I would describe it. She had already done it. It was her dream house. That's where she was going. Because she had dreamed about it. She had set the goals. She had done the work. And she was going to celebrate the achievement. That's the message I want to leave with you. Make it personal. Whatever your role is in your organization, make it personal. People are counting on you. And we want you to be able to build the life and the business of your dreams. Thanks for the chance to share a few thoughts. Have a great time, everybody. Thanks. We'll see you later.